So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Pre-Celerator Workshop. This is uh, our June 23rd edition. And uh, it is our, I don't know, I think it's probably close to our eighth uh, or ninth uh, workshop we're doing virtually. So uh, I appreciate you all coming in. And unfortunately, we're not providing lunch. Um, so you're on your own for that. But uh, we have a great uh, presentation today on equity and alternative compensation by one of our partners at Stubbs Alderton and Markley's. Uh, with no further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce to you, Louie Wharton. Great. Thank you, Len. Uh, welcome everyone to this afternoon's seminar. Excuse me, seminar. Uh, my name is Louie Wharton, as Len mentioned. I'm a partner in the uh, corporate transactional practice at Stubbs Alderton and Markley's. The firm represents emerging growth uh, startup and middle market companies in complex business transactions and litigation. My specialties are essentially negotiating and structuring uh, venture capital financing transactions, uh, assisting with mergers and acquisitions, and then representing public companies in their securities compliance work. Uh, today's presentation focuses on the work that I do with companies both uh, and uh, candidates as well, quite frankly, with respect to negotiating and structuring uh, employment arrangements. And so the discussion will focus on the perspective of both the company uh, employing the candidate and the candidate considering an opportunity. So let's dive right in. Essentially, when you think of compensation, you should think of it as more than simply the cash portions of the compensation. So obviously we're familiar with the base salary, there are bonus options such as an annual bonus, the first year guarantee or a signing or special bonus. But these days, particularly with respect to early stage companies and emerging growth companies, uh, the equity component of the compensation can play a significant role. Uh, that equity compensation can take the form of stock options, uh, actual stock grants, restricted stock, which is essentially stock that's subject to vesting, uh, and phantom stock. And we'll get into those items as we uh, proceed in the, in the seminar. Uh, obviously, there are also components for certain negotiated employment arrangements that include severance, and then vacation uh, and benefits as well. So this is one of the areas where essentially from the perspective of a candidate, right, the candidate will be evaluating an opportunity with respect to a compensation package that's been offered by uh, an employer. So in assessing the value to the particular candidate of the proposed uh, package, uh, candidates will evaluate where they are in their career. So if they are earlier in their careers, are they swinging for the fences? Or uh, if they're in the middle of their careers, are they trying to uh, maintain trajectory? If they're later in their careers, they may want more stability. So when thinking about the company itself, uh, candidates usually will think, well, a startup has you know, potential, potentially significant upside. However, given that the uh, startups typically have a low rate of success, there's more risk to achieve that value. With respect to a, an emerging growth or growth stage company, right, there's less upside because the company is established and so there's less risk, but there's credible cash and a, a more significant opportunity to likely achieve the value associated with the exit. And then with respect to established companies, obviously candidates would expect market compensation, uh, so cash and bonus. There may be some equity component included in that package as well, but equity usually plays a uh, less significant role with respect to established companies as opposed to early stage or intermediate companies. Um, obviously, candidates will seek information from the company when evaluating the opportunity. So from the company's perspective, you shouldn't be surprised if you get information in determining the equity that's been proposed. Um, if you can mute um, yourself by the way, if you're not, uh, uh, I guess, asking a question, that would be appreciated. And in fact, for questions, I don't know if everyone heard, but to the extent that you've got a question, feel free to include it in the chat, and then uh, Len will bring it to my attention. Thank you. ...in some type of employment agreement. Uh, employment agreements are useful because candidates and employers want written agreements to memorialize the negotiated terms. So things change. As uh, during the course of the employment arrangement, right? So, for example, you may have negotiated with your uh, you know, uh, direct report or perhaps a CEO, but those parties change. Uh, duties need to be outlined and, and clarified in written agreements as well. So, there are 
fewer questions with respect to whether or not a candidate is satisfying the, expe the expected obligations uh, negotiated as part of the um, employment arrangement. Recall that the offer is really the beginning of the negotiation, right? So from the candidates and the employer's perspective, once the negotiation is concluded, you've got to work with each other. And so it would be terrible to establish at the beginning of the working relationship, a very acrimonious or contentious negotiation. One of the ways that you can uh, assist in that process is by relying on counsel or other advisors to negotiate what are essentially standard or customary practices, right? So to the extent that there are questions with respect to specific components uh, of the negotiated uh, compensation package, feel free to rely on the advisors who have expertise with respect to what's customary and what's not to make the negotiation more efficient and to uh, retain uh, a cordial relationship between the candidate and employer. Um, so we've discussed the last bullet point, so let's move on. The mechanics of the agreement. Um, so you may have heard of employment agreements, you may have heard of uh, offer letters. The documents are essentially the same. Typically, an offer letter is less robust than an employment agreement, right? It usually simply has, you know, you're being hired to start on this day, your title, uh, summary of your duties, who you're reporting to, perhaps it includes uh, some equity component, uh, and that's about it. Uh, an employment agreement usually goes farther and essentially includes provisions with respect to severance, uh, depending on whether or not the employment terminates due to a uh, due to cause or for good reason, which is also referred to as a constructive termination. And we'll get into the specifics of those items as we continue. Um, you know, there may be additional provisions with respect to acceleration of equity to the extent that the employment relation terminates. Um, so if you're thinking about it again, offer letter usually is less robust. The employment agreement is usually more robust. But nothing prevents an offer letter from including the more robust provisions of an employment agreement, and nothing prevents an employment agreement from excluding uh, a few of the items that we've discussed. So really what's important is having a written document that memorializes the compensation arrangement uh, and the engagement that's been negotiated by the parties. Um, I think I've touched on most of the points in the second bullet point here with respect to what the agreement includes, so duties, term, if it's an employment agreement, what your compensation will be, uh, benefits, and then uh, what happens upon a separation from the company. Also recall that California is an at-will state, right? So essentially, the employer can terminate employment at any time, the employee can terminate his or her employment at any time. Really what the employment agreement or offer letter um, provides in that circumstance is what happens, right? So if you are terminated without cause, for example, what happens? or if you resign or you leave without cause or without good reason, what happens? So really, the employment agreement or the offer letter uh, addresses the specifics with respect to the employment arrangement and then in certain cases, what happens once you leave uh, the employment uh, relationship. So we've, uh, this is a reminder, we're gonna get into more of the specifics with respect to compensation. So this slide is simply again a reminder with respect to the various components. So let's talk about salary and bonus and how you, you evaluate that. So again, from the candidate's perspective, when looking at cash compensation versus equity, right, you're really thinking about um, how the short-term compensation, i.e. the cash and bonuses that you're getting, compare to the opportunity represented by uh, the equity. So in looking at the short-term compensation, uh, you look at your current compensation, whether or not what you're getting uh, is equivalent to what other similarly situated employees are getting based on any available market data. Um, and again, what the opportunity is. So the opportunity can be significant to the extent that it's an early stage venture, though risky, um, or less significant to the extent that it's an intermediate or mature company. Uh, candidates also look at the opportunity cost, right, of leaving their current uh, employment. So if I'm making, for example, a six-figure salary, but I'm going to uh, go below that, by joining an early stage or growth stage company, um, how do I make up for the potential reduction in compensation, cash compensation? So things like a signing bonus or a first year guarantee can assist in um, you know, making up the difference for that value. Um, if you're looking at more long-term value, then again, accelerated vesting in various circumstances can also contribute to an increase in value uh, to make up the difference between your established opportunity and what may be a more risky but potentially more significant upside offer. 
Uh, also, obviously, the um, particularly with respect to early stage ventures, equity awards can play a significant component of the compensation package. Okay. Um, there are multiple types uh, of equity awards. The typical award is either a stock option, which is a contract that enables the recipient to purchase shares for some period of time, typically 10 years, at a fixed price, which is usually as, uh, established at the current fair market value. So if the fair market value is a dollar today, then the recipient would have a term of 10 years to purchase some number of shares uh, at a price of a dollar. And presumably, as the company continues to increase in value, uh, the value of the stock increases as well, and so the recipient can gain that value by exercising the option and then ultimately selling the shares. We'll get into some of the tax considerations associated with that uh, later on in the presentation, but that's a typical structure for a stock option. Uh, equity awards also include stock awards, and so you can either grant stock with no purchase price, so it's simply handing out 100 shares, for example, and there are tax issues associated with that, uh, or you can make the stock um, purchasable. So the recipient actually has to pay a purchase price with respect to acquiring the stock. And the tax treatment for issuing stock, just granting it for no purchase price versus having a purchase price is different. Um, usually companies will go with the simple uh, grant. Uh, however, there may be circumstances or uh, conditions that may uh, advocate more favorably for providing a purchase option. Uh, and then the third uh, more typical option is an RSU again, way uh, less, you see those way less often than you do uh, awards of options or awards of stock or even stock purchase rights. An RSU is essentially a phantom equity unit. It's a contract that says if certain conditions are satisfied, then upon the satisfaction of those conditions, the company will settle the RSU for either stock or cash. Usually it's stock, but it can be cash. Uh, and so what's, what's great about an RSU is that there really aren't any tax consequences associated with the issuance of the RSU when it's uh, awarded. The tax comes when the RSU is settled. Again, we usually don't see RSUs. It's much more typical to have options or stock awarded as equity, but we wanted to raise the point in case um, you encounter it. Uh, in addition to the initial grant, right, uh, the company may have a policy of providing follow-on grants. And so in considering the opportunity, uh, a candidate may say, well, great for me to get the initial award now, but what happens if I continue to perform or excel over the next two or three years? Well, I have an opportunity to acquire additional equity in the company. And so one of the discussions that may occur would relate to whether or not there are follow-on grants on, for example, promotion or follow-on grants in connection with extraordinary performance, right? And you know, discussion will obviously include, you know, what's the size of those grants, how often are they made, etc. So don't be surprised if, as part of the negotiation, particularly for more sophisticated candidates, uh, they ask questions related to uh, follow-on equity to figure out, you know, how else that they they can achieve value uh, with respect to getting equity in the company. Uh, typically, the equity awards are best, um, so they are either exercisable in the case of an option over some extended period of time, or they are subject to forfeiture or repurchase to the extent that we are, we're talking about a stock award. Um, standard vesting is usually over four years. Um, typical is there's a one-year cliff, meaning that nothing vests before the one-year anniversary of the date of grant. And then following that one-year cliff, the remainder typically vests either monthly or quarterly, depending on what's negotiated by the partners. Um, so there's no uh, you know, more customary arrangement than that, uh, and parties can always deviate from that fairly customary arrangement to the extent that they determine it's appropriate, but four-year vesting with a one-year cliff is fairly standard. Um, the other point to raise is that usually the vesting is linked to the value uh, that will be provided over the term of service, right? So, Typically, you want companies want candidates to stick around for you know three to four year period, and so they link vesting to that period in order to achieve the full, full value of the services from the candidate over that time. Uh, other terms that would be included in uh, potentially option agreements include a cashless exercise. So essentially, rather than writing a check for uh, shares to exercise your option, you would essentially cause the company to withhold stock in order to exercise the option. Usually this uh, occurs in a circumstance where 
the value of the stock exceeds the exercise price of the option. So in our prior example, I believe that we said the option was uh, issued at a dollar exercise price. Let's say in three years, the stock is worth $2. Under a cashless exercise option, the recipient would enable the company to withhold stock having a value equivalent to the exercise price, right? So if you've got stock worth $2, obviously you'd have two shares uh, essentially um, for, I'm sorry, you'd have half a share uh, representing the exercise price for the option. Uh, and so there's a formula that's typically included in the option agreement that enables that calculation to occur so that recipients don't actually have to come out of pocket by paying cash. They can exercise their options, get the stock. They don't get as many shares, uh, but again, they don't have to come out of pocket for uh, for the cash required to exercise the option. Louis, yes, uh, we have a question. Uh, what happens if the stock has not been issued yet? Uh, under the option, I, I guess. Uh, so typically, with respect to an option, for the person asking the question, the stock wouldn't be issued until it's exercised. If your question is whether stock in the company has been been issued, perhaps you can clarify. Right, we're assuming that. The company has issued stock, it's got a stock incentive plan that provides for the issuance of these awards, and there's some number of shares reserved for issuance on exercise of the option. So at the time that you receive an option, right, there should be some equivalent number of shares reserved in the company's capitalization table to satisfy the exercise of the option, assuming that you have to there. Thank you. Okay. Uh, early exercise can also be included in option agreements. They, uh, so essentially, we've talked about what is a standard or typical vesting schedule. However, in certain circumstances, um, the administrator of the plan may provide that rather than waiting for a full year, you might be able to exercise early. The reason to exercise an option early is to start the capital gains holding treatment. Uh, however, essentially, options, particularly incentive stock options that are exercised early, lose the favorable ISO tax treatment. Um, we'll get into that a little later. Um, but it's possible that, you know, if someone isn't necessarily concerned with respect to ISO treatment, they may want to exercise the option early to start the capital gains holding period. Uh, and so that is an option that is sometimes included in option agreements. Uh, and then finally on this slide, essentially, um, thinking about accelerated vesting on the sale of the company. So uh, will there be single trigger vesting or double trigger vesting? You may have heard of these terms. Single trigger uh, acceleration simply requires that a change of control occur for vesting to accelerate. So upon the consummation of a change of control, vesting will fully accelerate and the recipient will be entitled to exercise you know, the full number of shares under an option or will be entitled to retain the full number of shares mm -hmm. under a stock uh, award. Double trigger acceleration requires, in addition to the occurrence of the change of control, a termination event associated with that event, usually within a period of 12 months. So you've got to have a change of control and your service is terminated usually without cause by the company during 12 months following that change of control. So that's why there's the double trigger, two triggers essentially. And in that circumstance, then usually the vesting would accelerate and you would uh, be entitled to achieve the full value of the shares underlying either the option award or the stock award. I referenced previously the fact that you shouldn't be surprised to the extent that a candidate comes and says, okay, well, I'm getting an equity award. How do I actually evaluate what that means, right? Well, what does it mean that I'm getting an option, for example, to purchase 10,000 shares of common stock uh, at an exercise price of a dollar a share? And so typically what uh, you would expect would be for a candidate to request, obviously, documentation with respect to the equity incentive plan to understand what the rights, preferences, and privileges are with respect to the award, um, you know, circumstances under which they can be exercised, what happens after termination, et cetera, right? They need to understand that full package in order to determine, you know, okay, what circumstances am I likely to exercise this option in? What happens in connection with the change of control? Again, aggregating all of this to, to determine or assist with determining what the value of the equity is to the individual. Uh, a request for a current capitalization table is also not unusual. Uh, this doesn't need to be a detailed cap table, and in fact, for issuers, I wouldn't recommend uh, providing a detailed cap table. However, it's not unreasonable for a candidate to request some information with respect to what the outstanding shares look like in order to determine where they fall in the aggregate scheme of things. 
right? So typically you would have some aggregated number reflected by the outstanding common shares, uh, the outstanding preferred shares, you know, the outstanding options, and then what's available in the pool. So that basic information should enable the candidate to determine where he or she stands vis-a-vis uh, -vis the total outstanding shares of the company. Uh, related to the capitalization table is an explanation of uh, other investors' preference rights. So for companies that have issued preferred shares, right, typically in a liquidation transaction or change of control, those shares receive a distribution prior to any distribution going out to the common holders. And so it makes sense for a recipient of an option to purchase, for example, common shares to gain an understanding with respect to how, you know, how much of the proceeds need to be issued before holders of common stock will participate in the distribution. So getting a sense of where the liquidation preferences are currently uh, is a reasonable request from the perspective of the candidate. Uh, actually, the, obviously the restricted stock agreement or the option agreement to again understand what the rights, preferences, and privileges are. Prices of previous rounds to establish what the value is, where it's been and where it's going. Uh, and then the current 490 evaluation, which is essentially the fair market value is determined by an independent valuation firm, right? So all of that, uh, that, that, all of those items are reasonable for the candidate to request and the company to provide to assist the candidate in evaluating uh, what the true value of the equity is to that particular candidate. Louis, question uh, has come up. Are there any standard equity arrangements where the founder's shares are used? instead of an ESOP? Um, so no, uh, it's unusual to use quote unquote founder shares. And I, I know there, this term is around, I mean, essentially founder shares are just the shares of common stock typically uh, issued uh, at the formation of the enterprise, right? So, you know, let's say there are three founders each getting a million shares. Those are quote unquote the founder shares, but those founder shares are no different from the common stock that may be issued to an advisor down the road uh, or, you know, another purchaser of the company's common stock. It is atypical and unusual to use the founder shares uh, to underlie uh, equity compensation rules. Uh, usually that's provided under an incentive plan. And the reason for that, there are a couple of reasons. The first is that the incentive plan qualifies for applicable exemptions under state and federal securities laws. And so you don't have to worry about complying with securities laws provided that you issue the securities pursuant to a compliant plan. The second is that you can gain favorable tax treatment, particularly with respect to ISOs, to the extent that they are issued under a compliant plan, right? So there are tax advantages and there are advantages with respect to compliance with applicable securities laws that strongly advocate for issuing equity awards under an incentive plan. Um, nothing prevents a company from issuing, for example, an option outside of an incentive plan, and you would essentially come up with a standalone form of option agreement for that recipient, but you don't necessarily have uh, the ISO treatment or the um, exemption under securities laws, unless again, you comply with the applicable requirements. So if you're gonna comply with the applicable, excuse me, applicable requirements, you might as well implement the stock incentive plan that does all of those things from the outset. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so getting into some of the uh, equity tax considerations. So uh, I've got to caveat this by saying this is not tax advice and obviously uh, facts and circumstances may vary with respect to particular situations. So this is a general summary with respect to what the tax treatment is going to be for various incentive awards, but uh, issuers should certainly consult with individual counsel and candidates should as well to determine what the tax consequence, excuse me, consequences will be for their circumstances. Okay, so with that caveat, diving in. Uh, stock options are generally not taxed when granted, all right? So favorable to the employee because you don't have to worry about taxes. Stock grants are taxed at ordinary uh, income rates, right? So remember the option is the agreement to purchase stock, the stock grants is you actually receive the stock uh, upon the issuance of the award. The tax is incurred in the year of grant for fully vested shares. So if there's no vesting schedule, then you take the value of the stock into income, assuming that you got a stock award, okay? If you purchase the stock, then you take into income the difference between the price you paid and fair market value. If you purchase the stock at fair market value, you'd have zero gain, and so there wouldn't be any tax, okay? Uh, to the extent that uh, the stock is subject to vesting, then taxes are taken into account in the year of grant for shares subject to vesting, 
if the recipient files an 83B election. So what the 83B election says is IRS, and I guess I should back up by explaining, Section 83B of the Internal Revenue Code essentially says that to the extent that equity is subject to a right of forfeiture, meaning vesting, then tax is owed in the year in which the right of forfeiture lapses. So if you think about vesting over a four-year period, right, at the end of the year, year one, 25% will be vested in our standard arrangement. And so you would take into account the value of those shares in year one. Uh, at year two, another 25% would be vested. And so you take into account the tax associated with the value for year two, et cetera, et cetera. The reason that's problematic is because we're all assuming that the value of the company increases over time, right? And so you would end up paying more taxes in year two, year three, and year four because the value of the equity has increased. In order to avoid that, uh, the IRS have made, has made it possible for recipients to file what is an 83B election notice. And so you notify the IRS to say, notwithstanding the fact that these shares are subject to right of forfeiture over years two, three, and four, I'm electing to pay taxes on the full value in year one, right? Uh, and so, and obviously the reason for that is because you wanna pay taxes at the current value as opposed to the increased value. Uh, so that's the benefit. The downside is that to the extent that the shares don't fully vest and they are either repurchased or they're subject to forfeiture, right? The recipient will have paid taxes on shares that he or she doesn't own anymore, right? So there is that potential downside by filing the 83B election this year, that you may actually forfeit the shares that you have invested in if you leave the company, let's say, in year two, right? But you will already pay taxes in year one. Uh, that's why I say it really is an individual determination. If you think that you're going to be with the company for the entire four years, it likely makes a ton of sense to file the 83B. Um, you know, if the stock is issued at a very low value because the company is very early stage, it probably makes sense to file the 83B election to take advantage of the low tax associated with the low current value for the stock. But it really is an individual analysis. Um, the one thing to note is that the 83B election has to be filed within 30 days following issuance, no exceptions. So if you receive stock that's subject to vesting, please be mindful of the fact that if you're going to file an 83B election, you've got to do it within 30 days. Okay. Uh, and then we've talked about uh, in the year when they vested, the recipient does not file an 83B election. I know that that's a complicated um, you know, issue. Uh, suffice it to say, I think the, the big takeaway here is if the recipient receives stock that's subject to vesting, he or she should consult with tax advisors with respect to determining whether or not, based on his or her tax circumstance, it makes sense to file an 83B election with the IRS. Okay. Um, continuing with the uh, equity tax consideration. So with respect to an ISA, which is an incentive stock option, an incentive stock option is an option that's granted at fair market value. It has to be uh, granted to an employee. So ISOs can't be granted to non-employees. Uh, shares issued upon the exercise of an ISO are not taxed when issued. So again, the option, the ISO is not taxed when it's issued and it's not taxed when it's exercised. So again, a second favorable tax treatment associated with an ISO. When sold, shares issued upon the exercise of an ISO are taxed at capital gains rates, provided that such shares aren't sold within two years from the date the option is granted, nor within one year after exercise. Otherwise, they're taxed at ordinary income rates. So you can see that there are particular strictures associated with fully taking advantage of the favorable tax treatment, namely being taxed on the sale of your shares at capital gains rates versus ordinary income rates, associated with ISOs, but you've got to comply with the obligations. You can't have sold within two years from the date the option is granted. You can't have exercise within one year after um, uh, the date of grant, right? So essentially that's why we typically structure the vesting schedule as we do with a one year cliff and thereafter uh, either monthly or quarterly vesting, okay? Shares issued upon the exercise of a non-qualified option, i.e. options that are not ISOs, are taxed at ordinary income rates. So if you can qualify for an ISO and you hold it for the requisite period, you've got the potential for more favorable tax treatment than if you receive a non-qualified option. Recall, however, that only employees can receive ISOs. Everyone else, to the extent that they're receiving an option, has to receive a non-qualified option. Uh, there are also particular conditions with respect to issuing ISOs to greater than 10% holders. So if the recipient, uh, 
holds more than 10% of the company's outstanding shares, then the term of an ISO can be no greater than five years as opposed to 10 years. And the exercise price has to be at least 110% of fair market value as opposed to just fair market value. This is particularly relevant with respect to quote unquote founders who typically have a much larger uh, percentage ownership of the company. Uh, and again, stock incentive plans that are properly drafted address all of these concerns. So just to reiterate, to the extent that a company is looking to issue uh, incentive awards, it makes sense for that company to do so under an incentive plan. And from the candidates or recipients perspective, you want to make sure that you're also getting awards that are issued under an appropriately drafted uh, equity plan to take advantage potentially of the favorable tax treatment associated with ISOs and to also confirm that you know, applicable securities laws have been complied with. Um, more on the tax considerations because they are complex and nuanced. Uh, with respect to, and we're not going to get into, or I'm not going to get into the specifics, excuse me, the specifics of all of this again, because these really are complex issues. So what I've tried to do is I've tried to summarize them in this presentation, but I continue to reiterate that to the extent that these issues arise, it's important to consult with applicable tax advisors based on particular tax circumstances in order to determine what the treatment will be for your circumstance. Okay. Um, so with respect to ISO, it's not withstanding the fact that you are taxed at capital gains rates, right? The income spread at ISO exercise can trigger the alternative minimum tax. Uh, in 2018, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act made changes to make it less likely that ISO exercise will trigger the AMT. However, again, you've got to look at your personal uh, circumstances. So it's better than it used to be, but uh, your personal circumstances may still trigger AMT in connection with the exercise of an ISO. So recall that ISOs when exercised aren't taxed, however, depending on your circumstance, uh, they may trigger AMT for your personal tax file. There was an additional uh, uh, regulation, the Empowering Employees Through Stock Ownership Act, that allows employees in a privately held company to elect to defer taxes at option exercise or RSU vesting for up to five years. However, that only applies if the stock is issued for performance uh, of services as an employee. If during the calendar year in which the company was an eligible corporation, it issued that stock. And the definition of eligible corporation is not public with a written plan. So again, another reason for the company to have a written plan in which during the calendar year, not less than 80% of all employees in the US are granted stock options or RSUs with the same rights and privileges to receive qualified stock. I think that this is probably the factor that makes uh, relying on the empowering employees through Stock Ownership Act most difficult, uh, because I don't necessarily think that most startup companies or growth companies have equity distribution at the 80% level. Uh, obviously, you've got to you know, look at the facts and circumstances as I continue to indicate, but in order to rely on this five-year deferral, uh, you've got to have a company that was a, an eligible corporation uh, when the uh, incentive award was issued. And then the final condition is that uh, the stock is not subject to a repurchase right, right? So again, another factor that makes it somewhat difficult for uh, parties to comply with the requirements of the Empowering Employees Through Stock Ownership Act. However, uh, for your knowledge and you know, worth asking the questions to the extent that you're a recipient uh, of equity awards, you can ask your, your uh, issuer or your employer whether or not They've undertaken an analysis to determine whether or not uh, the company qualifies. Okay, so moving on to the treatment of equity upon termination. Uh, with respect to ISOs, post-termination, you're only permitted to exercise those for 90 days. Uh, no similar uh, requirement for non-qualified options. However, the typical post-termination uh, exercise period is one year. Okay? Um, and then typically the company may exercise repurchase rights uh, for shares that are subject to repurchase at a repurchase price, usually within a, some period of 90 days um, post termination, right? Uh, again, no magic to that. Um, usually it's 90 days, the company can provide for shorter or longer periods of time. Uh, the point to raise, of raising this is simply for folks to be aware that, you know, repurchase rights may apply, notwithstanding the fact that uh, equity awards may be vested and that you should take into consideration 
the company's ability to uh, repurchase shares to the extent that you're separated from your employment with the company. Okay, uh, moving on to severance. Um, so typically severance is payable upon termination for good reason or with, without cause. We'll get into those definitions shortly. Uh, usually it consists of salary, so some additional amount of compensation, uh, typically three months of your base salary to one year. Uh, usually some component of bonus, which is prorated for the current year to the extent that you're eligible for an annual bonus. Uh, some type of accelerated vesting, usually linked to the additional period in which cash uh, severance compensation is paid, and then continuation of healthcare and other benefits, uh, usually under COBRA. So what does good reason mean? Uh, typical good reason definitions um, include a material negative change to the circumstances of your employment. And give me one second. Okay, just making sure because I want to get to calls. Okay. So typical good reason definitions include a reduction in salary or other guaranteed compensation. Now, sometimes there's a carve out here that says, unless you know the salary of similarly situated uh, employees is, you know, reduced on a pro rata level. So the example here would be, for example, management takes a 10% haircut in order to conserve cash, uh, enable the company to operate on existing cash, right? In that circumstance, uh, folks may think, well, we've all taken the sacrifice of reduced compensation. That shouldn't give uh, a, a particular employee good reason to terminate their employment. And remember, if you can terminate for good reason, then you usually are eligible to receive the severance benefits that are provided under your employment document, okay? Uh, other good reason uh, points include relocation of the workplace uh, outside of a reasonable distance. It depends on where you're located in uh, Los Angeles. You know, that could be 10 miles you know, to the extent that, that causes your commute to increase by an hour. Uh, in other places, uh, a lot more. Um, failure to have a successor entity assume your agreement. Uh, reduction in your authority, duties, or responsibilities. And again, these are negotiated. These are some of the general uh, conditions and provisions that usually constitute or uh, incorporate are incorporated in the definition of good reason, but uh, candidates and employers can negotiate for additional uh, items or you know fewer items. So it really is a negotiation with respect to the particular employment document. Uh, good reason usually requires a notice of the event and the opportunity for the employer to cure over typically what is a 30-day period. Okay, so definition for cause. So cause is usually uh, incorporates some material negative aspect of your performance of your obligations. So that would be a material breach of any of your agreements with the company, uh, your conviction or a no contest plea to a felony or other crime of moral turpitude, dishonest or fraudulent activities with respect to the company, uh, gross negligence, incompetence or willful misconduct with respect to the company, uh, willful and persistent refusal to follow reasonable lawful directives of the board and breach of the fiduciary duties of the company. Okay, uh, usually requires uh, notice of cause, I think this should say, not good reason, so apologies for that, uh, and uh, an opportunity to cure to the extent that the cause can be cured. Okay, um, again, typically, for example, if you've been convicted uh, of uh, fraud or felony, Obviously, there's no opportunity there to cure. But for example, if you fail to follow lawful directives of the board, then it makes sense to have an opportunity for you to cure that as well. Okay. Um, maybe I'll pause there then to see if there are any questions because we're moving into other aspects of the um, employment arrangement with respect to non solicitation. So, so, so Willie? Yeah. A uh, question that has come up. Is there an industry accepted definition of gross negligence versus only negligence? So I don't think, so maybe I'll ask you a question by saying it depends on the industry, right? Uh, generally speaking, there are no definitions that say for a software programmer, gross negligence, excuse me, gross negligence constitutes X, right? Um, to the extent that a party is concerned with respect to whether or not a particular example might constitute gross negligence, right? Council can, of course, review how that particular circumstance has been addressed in case law to the extent that it has been addressed, right? So um, failure to include material code by a software programmer. Has that issue been addressed in case law? Can we determine how a court is likely to interpret uh, that failure vis-a-vis -vis 
negligence versus gross negligence, right? It's a fact and circumstances inquiry, unfortunately. Um, and there's no guide that I can provide in connection with where you would look to determine whether or not for a particular industry, some set of behavior constitutes gross negligence. Um, you know, a lot of factors go into the, the analysis as well. So if, for example, it's customary in particular industries for folks who are, you know, establishing the profession to undertake certain best practices, um, you know, in theory, a failure to undertake those best practices could weigh in an analysis of whether or not someone has engaged in negligence versus gross negligence in the performance of his or her duties. But I'm loath to say that, you know, uh, failure simply to, uh, to abide by understood best practices constitutes gross negligence. It's really a facts and circumstances analysis. And you really got to look at, you know, what happened, where, under what circumstances in order to make that determination. Thank you. You answered the question for the ask. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, moving on to uh, a few additional concepts with respect to the employment arrangement. So uh, it, it's not unusual for employers to request that uh, employees enter into what are confidentiality and proprietary invention and information assignments agreements. And we'll get to some of the other concepts associated with the PEIA shortly. Um, but the non-solicitation concepts are important, so I wanted to raise those here. So the non-solicitation uh, clause essentially prohibits the employee from soliciting uh, customers, vendors, and or employees when they leave the company, right? Usually you're prohibited from doing that while you're at the company. And then once you leave the company, you also have an obligation not to solicit customers, vendors, or employees, right? Usually that obligation is anywhere from 12 to 24 months following your departure from the company. That's not unusual, okay? Uh, activities that are covered include direct solicitation or indirect solicitation. So you individually going to a customer and saying, hey, my new company is better than my old company, so you should certainly come to do business with us, versus you telling your coworker, well, I know of this customer, I think that they would have a better opportunity here versus my old company, so you should reach out to the customer, right? That's an indirect solicitation. Same would apply in connection with employees. Um, covered parties, as I've indicated, include employees, uh, usually employed for some period uh, before your separation. So typically that's six months, right? Because you've interacted with those folks before you left. You've gotten to know their capabilities, presumably. And so you shouldn't be essentially uh, able to solicit employees at the date of your separation and for a period of six months before because you're aware of who those folks are, right? And then and we've uh, talked about customers and vendors as well. Um, there's a related concept to non-solicitation, which is the non-compete. Uh, in California, non-competes are only enforceable during the term of employment or in connection with the sale of business. So to the extent that an employment agreement contains a non-compete in California post-termination, and then it's not associated with the sale of business, that non-compete is unenforceable. More importantly, there's California case law that says to the extent that uh, an agreement includes a non-compete, then that can cause the employment agreement to be voidable, okay? So it's not enough to simply say, well, it's unenforceable, but we're gonna include it anyway, just in case. In California employment arrangements, they should not include non-compete provisions unless those employment arrangements are entered into in connection with the sale of business. One caveat to note, uh, employees are never able to use a company's trade secrets to compete, okay? So simply because you can't enter into a non-compete agreement with a California employee doesn't mean that that employee gets to use your treats your trade secrets to compete against you, right? So that's another exception, okay? And then other considerations. So we talked about the PIIA or the Proprietary Information and Inventions Assignment Agreement. Um, it's best practices, particularly for technology companies to have every employee enter into this document, okay? And so this document does a couple of things. First, it requires the employee to maintain the confidentiality of the company's confidential information, okay? Second, it requires the employee to assign to the company any intellectual property developed by the employee while working for the employer, okay? So the invention has to relate to the company's business, either contemplated or current, uh, using company resources and conducted on company time. And to the extent that any of you know, those factors apply, then any intellectual property that's invented by the employee is assigned to the company 
at the time of invention under the provisions of the PII. Very important because, again, for technology companies, you've got software developers working on technology, you've got scientists and or researchers. The company needs to own its intellectual property because there could potentially be significant value associated with the IP, right? So you wanna make sure that the company owns it and you've got documentation in place to provide a clear chain of title in connection with the assignment from the employees and service providers to the company, okay? Um, last point here is that it requires disclosure of existing inventions as of the date of employment to carve them out from the general assignment. So California law provides that, um, there are two, two issues here. First, if you've invented something before you joined the company, the company should have known that, right? And so you have the ability to carve those inventions out under the provisions of the PIA. Uh, separately, California law also provides that to the extent that you are creating inventions on your own, not involving the company's business, not involving the company's resources, and not on the company's time, then those inventions continue to belong to you, right? And so typically the PIA will also include the explicit statutory language informing uh, employees that their inventions are their own, provided that they don't relate to the company's business and are not created on company time using company resources. Again, this is a very standard document uh, and we encourage every company as part of the uh, employment, uh, the commencement of the employment arrangement with, with employees and quite frankly, with consultants as well uh, under their consulting services agreements to enter into appropriate confidentiality and invention assignment agreements so that first, confidential information is retained as confidential and second, to the extent that inventions are created related to the company's business, those inventions are assigned to the company. So that's the presentation. Questions? Okay, Louis, uh, let me unmute everybody and that way sure. if someone wants to ask a question, I can do that. All right, folks, you're, you all are unmuted unless you've mute yourself. If anybody has a question, now would be a great time to uh, ask that. Eric, you're waiting for Eric to unmute yourself. Finally, I was like muting, unmuting, muting, unmuting. <clears throat> uh, Louie, can you comment about um, independent contractors and how independent contractors, not employees, play into um, whether they're awarded equity, uh, how that might be different than an employee. Uh, same thing with confidentiality and independent contractors versus employees. Sure. Um, so the standard equity incentive plan uh, will enable the company to provide or issue incentive awards to employees, consultants, directors, etc. Okay, so your status doesn't have to be that of an employee in order to be eligible to receive an incentive award under an appropriately drafted uh, equity incentive plan. Um, you, depending on the, and the, usually the consulting arrangement is likely more short term and is subject to particular deliverables rather than a typical employment rate, right? So in that circumstance, um, usually there may be, in addition to time-based vesting, which is the standard vesting arrangement for employees, milestone or performance uh, vesting, right? So you will vest in 25% of the shares to the extent that you achieve these milestones. And the milestones would be uh, outlined in the uh, consulting agreement or the, the uh, incentive award agreement. And it would be clearly measurable so that there wouldn't be ambiguity with respect to whether or not the milestones have been achieved. So in that circumstance, if the milestone is achieved, then the equity vests and uh, the recipient is entitled usually to retain the equity. Um, so th those are the biggest differences. However, nothing prevents a company from issuing, for example, an option to a consultant to the extent that the company is anticipating a long-term consulting arrangement with the consultant providing services that may not necessarily be as discreet as previously discussed, right? So there may be a range of, uh, of, of services that will be provided by the consultant over a two-year period, for example. And so it would make sense for the company in that circumstance with respect to the equity award that's granted to the consultant to have a vesting period of over two years, for example, simply based on time, right? So, so long as you continue to provide the services and your consulting arrangement remains in place, you will continue to vest and will have the ability to 
uh, exercise the option if it's an option or vest in stock if it's a stock award uh, as the uh, arrangement continues. Um, so that was the first part of your question. And then remind me of the second part of your question, Eric. Apologies. Yeah, is he muted? <laughs> He's okay. <clears throat> there you go. Yeah. Thank you. So we were talking about um, uh, non-disclosure, confidentiality, non-compete as a consultant um, versus uh, an employee. And I'm assuming those are, you know, my experience is they're separate contracts that are managed as each individual co type of a contract. Correct. So the, the, the consulting room would be its own document, uh, obviously. Um, it would be customary to include uh, confidentiality obligations in a consulting agreement as it would be customary to include invention assignment language in that agreement to the extent that the consultant is working on intellectual property or uh, the company's uh, trade secrets, right? So th there's no meaningful difference between uh, obligating an employee to abide by those uh, contractual provisions and obligating a consultant to abide by those provisions. The company has an interest in both circumstances in ensuring that each party retains and maintains the confidentiality of the company's information, and each party assigns to the company intellectual property development. Um, the, the difference would be with respect to non uh, Let's talk about that in a second. I'm um, sorry, you're breaking up. Can you say it again, please? Sure. The difference would be? The, the, there would be a difference between, uh, for, for the non-compete, for example, right? So. Uh, outside, in California, again, non competes are not enforceable. Outside of California, in certain jurisdictions, non are enforceable. Okay? And that non complete, <clears throat> excuse me, non compete is relevant for contractors like myself or for employees both. Is that correct? So that's, that's the point I'm raising. It would be unusual for a contractor dealing with you know, a variety of clients to enter into an agree to a non compete, even in a jurisdiction where non competes are enforceable. Right? So uh, that, that would be simply highly unusual, um, simply because one would expect that a contractor would be providing bona fide services to a variety of clients in the same industry with respect to the contractor's expertise. Okay? Now, the one thing that we haven't dis discussed, um, in California, it's very difficult to qualify as an independent contractor, right? And I'm right. sure you've heard of the fact that it's become very difficult to actually maintain that as a contractor unless you meet several stricter requirements uh, promulgated under California law, right? So um, the underlying, I think, inquiry and analysis is, before we get to all these questions with respect to how these provisions apply in the circumstance of a contractor, is whether or not the relationship is truly one of an independent contractor or an employee, right? And so that analysis has to be performed uh, in order to determine what's applicable under California law. And then based on the results of that analysis, the parties can proceed to figure out how they contract and what the appropriate document is, right? But it's no longer simply the case that if you are simply an independent contractor uh, and you've done so historically, you qualify as an independent contractor under California law, right? That right, AB5, right? Exactly right, AB5, a, a robust analysis that needs to be performed uh, to determine that you are, in fact, a contractor. And uh, usually the presumption is that you are an employee. Right, versus the contractor, particularly if you are spending a significant amount of time with the company performing services that are within the company's line of business. Right? So if, for example, you're just the outside um, CFO, you're a quote-unquote contractor, um, but you're providing all of the work that the company's internal CFO would perform, then there's a real question with respect to whether or not you are uh, an independent contractor. Different from you know, a, a CFO organization, Right, that it's an enterprise with multiple CFOs that are hired to provide contractual services uh, to various clients. Right, and so this is not in the scope of this discussion. In fact, we have a presentation by Employment Council that addresses these issues uh, in, in much greater detail. So, my recommendation, Len, I don't know, have we had that? Um, we had an AB5 uh, and California contractor employment law session done by our attorneys. Uh, Jeff Gersh and Garrett Hill. So that's up on YouTube? And that's available on our YouTube. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, it was a great pleasure, presentation. I think I'll have significant uh, additional information for you. Thank you. Great presentation. Thanks, everybody. Anybody else have a question? Louie, thank you very much, as always. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>
Appreciate the questions. All right, we're done. <laughs>